Nurgle is the Lord of Decay, who presides over physical corruption and morbidity. He is the father of plagues, and putrefactions are attracted to him like flies to a rotted corpse. For his amusement, he devises foul contagions that he inflicts upon the mortal world, the result of which greatly fascinate him. Nurgle's gaze thus drawn to those mortals bloated with sickness, and he generously favors those who spread disease in his name. To Nurgle, every rattled corpse is a welcoming nursery for wriggling maggots and cloying plague spores. Every stagnant lake and rotting forest is a paradise in which parasitic larvae and bountiful poxes can flourish. These are the gifts that Nurgle lavishes upon the mortal realms, and if there is malice behind his generosity, it is directed only to those ingrates who try to decline his offerings. Hello, all you wonderful listeners. It is I, Nobbler G, and welcome to Nurgle November, a lore study of all things Nurgle in the Age of Sigmar setting. This series will take us through what we know and do not yet know of Nurgle and all of his followers leading up to their awesome release this December. So please, sit back and enjoy this look into the Plague Father's world of corruption in the series brought to you by Grimdark Live, called Nurgle November. This tale of Nurgle's minions shall be told of a Chaos Lord of Nurgle, a Chaos Sorcerer of Nurgle, and a Champion of Nurgle, otherwise known as the Magoth Riders. Orgot's one and only wish is to become a true demon. His origins are buried under the blood-fecked snow of three hundred winters. Though the people of his tribe whisper that he was born of an unholy union between a great unclean one and a human witch. Whether this tryst was the result of a demonic pact or something even more foul, it is best not dwelt upon. Orgots is consumed by resentment that he has one foot in the mortal realm and one in what he sees as his rightful domain, the Garden of Nurgle. The enemies of his tribe call Orgots the Bastard King, though none use this title in his presence, for the well of buried anger that suffocates the warlord's soul can boil over at a single deadly instant. The realm of chaos ebbs and flows across the lands as the power of the dark gods waxes and wanes, and at times it has spite over the mountains to consume all of its peaks and those who dwell in its shadow. Orgots has, at times, even walked twisting pathways of the Garden of Nurgle, though instead of being the transcendent paradise he had hoped, it proved instead a tantalizing hell. The bastard king wandered the realm of chaos, at one step removed, able to see the garden unfold around him, but unable to breathe in the nostril-blasting scent of its bright fungus or taste the rancid spores that floated lazily through the air. It was a vision of heaven dangled in front of his aching senses, granting not peace but instead flaming Orgot's desire to appreciate Nurgle's gifts fully. The only thing he was able to touch were a pair of rot-bladed axes that he found embedded deep in the trunk of a twisted tree that had once been a dreaming life wizard. The axes were of mortal origin, and though it took every ounce of his strength, Orgots wenched them loose and took them for his own. He fights with these plague-caked rot axes to this very day, a permanent reminder of the time he stood upon the threshold of his destiny. There was a period in Orgots' history where he would regularly consort with and even consume the demonic servants of the Lord of Decay in an attempt 
the contract Nurgle's rot. He did this in the hope that he would die from the spiritual disease and become a plague bearer, as so many lesser tribesmen before him had done. Devout as he was, he felt sure that the Lord of Decay would take pity on his devoted dis disciple and reforge him in immortal form. Ironically, the same unnatural resilience granted to him by his half-demon nature kept him from the embrace of death and the nirvana that lay on the other side. Nurgle's rot claimed him as a vessel, even reshaping his mortal form so that the single horn of a plague bearer sprouted from his skull in a place of his left eye, but it did not claim him completely as he had hoped, though he has since spread that most transcendent of diseases to countless mortals, Orgot's remains stranded on the mortal plane. Like countless warlords before him, Orgots walks the path to glory in search of his final God's favor. This treacherous road leads only to death, to transformation into a milling chaos spawn, or, for a rare few, to immortality as a demon prince, though Orgots' demonic allies have imitated that even demon princes bear the stigma of the mortal seed that birthed them. He strives for that status nonetheless. For if he wins favor enough to cross the divide, he will at last become a true immortal. In his quest for Nurgle's approval, Orgots has sailed in search of glory on many occasions. He has led entire tribes south across many seas, through the wilderness of many lands, and into many mortal realms. He fought at the Battle of the Gates of Azir itself during the Great War challenging and swiftly slaying the warriors and grand masters of the Sigmarite armies themselves, but none that were sent could stop him. Though Orgots considers himself a mere shadow of the warrior he will one day become, in battle he has always proved to be a force of terrible destruction. Heavily armored and all but immune to physical wounds, those fast enough to land a blow on Orgot's stout frame invariably find their attack shrugged off and decapitating blow leveled at them in return. Even those of his blows that do not truly connect can be lethal. A single scratch from the rod axes will fester and turn gangrenous in a second, laying the victim low even as Orgot barrels past in search of fresh opportunities to prove his worth. Those assailants that do manage to penetrate Orgot's armor and pierce his skin quickly learn the truth behind his name. Whenever the warlord's flesh is opened, a gout of demonic ichor spews out with shocking force. Its vitrilic potency is enough to burn through steel and dissolve the flesh beneath. It is a testament to the length of Orgot's violent odyssey that more men have been killed by his tainted lifeblood than by the blades of the latter-day champions that march alongside of him. The demonic bate that runs in Orgoth's blood proved unpredictably useful in the harness of Whippermaw, the pox maggoth the warlord rides to war. Orgoth's first encountered the monstrous maggot thing slumbering in the quagmires of the Eternal Lagoon. Guided into the stinky morass by a vision of Nurgle's fecundant favor, Orgoths wisely waited until the Whippermaw was in digestive torpor after devouring a swamp drake before approaching the beast. The Magath slammed a long claw into Orgoth's neck, but just as its long tongue whipped out to ensnare him and yank him towards and into its gashing mouth, the scent of demonic ichor gave the beast pause. Seeing his chance, Orgoths caught the beast's lashing tongue in its gauntlet and swung up onto its back, using the whip-like appendage as an improvised rein with which to yank the pox maggoth left and right until it learned to obey his commands. Any other warrior would have been swiftly thrown off and chewed in half, but the scent of Nurgle's favor ran in Orgoth's veins. So, it is that he rides a powerful pox maggoth to this very day a beast just as impervious to harm as its master. 
As the scale of his deeds grows even greater, Orgoth's chances of true immortality become greater with every passing night. This was the tale of Orgoth's Demon Spew, Chaos Lord of Nurgle. From afar, the sorcerer Bloa Bratzbon appears to be constantly surrounded by swarms of unnatural insects, but only his fellow warriors in his tribe know that Bloab is in fact the Swarm, and the Swarm is Bloab, though there was a time when he was a tall and athletic warrior. Now there is nothing left of his mortal form but a sack of leathery skin filled with wriggling demon maggots. Even as a child, Bloab had an unhealthy fascination for the smaller forms of life in the world. He took great joy in pulling the legs from snow spiders and trapping the ice moths inside wax-sealed skulls until they starved to death. It was a habit that he took with him into his adolescence and then into his adulthood, which was his persecution to the peaks. Most diminutive creatures that Bloab eventually came to notice, and that garnered the notice of Grandfather Nurgle. You see, Nurgle values all forms of life no matter how small, on some level, it offended him that such a powerful young warrior spent his time seeking out and mutilating the least of foes instead of claiming glory by cutting down the champions of the Urfather's rivals. Every winter, Bloab fought alongside the rest of his tribe's menfolk against the tribes of many other enemy tribes, but when spring approached, he always went back to his sadistic one-man war against the world of the tiny creatures that eke out a life in the Arctic wastes. As with most of his tribe's menfolk, Nurgle had given Bloab the gifts of resilience, though the Lord of Decay usually toughens the constitution of his devotees so that they can better appreciate the plagues that spill out from his garden. Bloab's skin became thunder tusk thick for quite a different reason. The Lord of Decay resolved to teach Bloab a lesson. On one of his long hunting expeditions, the young warrior began to find ever larger and more surreal forms of insects. One by one, he took his dagger to them, cutting them into pieces and cooking their chitinous legs over small cave fires for sustenance. One night, when the moon held high and waxed full, Bloab was taking his rest in a cave near the forests. He had just enjoyed a long but arduous day of torturing large insects and small animals, and as night fell, he drifted into a deep sleep. He started snoring loud enough to scare off every creature and critter around the cave. As his dream strayed into the Garden of Nurgle, a demon fly with human features wound its way down from the craters of the surface of the cave and flew lazily spirals into Bloeb's cavern refuge. Another then came down from the skies, then three more, and soon more after that. Soon the cave echoed to the roar of thick black swarms, but still Bloab did not wake. Forming a twisting funnel like that of a tornado, the demon flies dived for his yawning mouth and plunged deep down into his throat and into his body. There they laid eggs by the thousands nestling the clutches of their larvae in his lungs, his guts, and his heart. Once their business was done, they flew out once more into the night, blood slicked and grinning. Bloab woke in agony from the strange and disturbing dreams, his insides burning. Within him the demon fly larva had hatched, and the wriggling beasts were eating him alive from the inside out. Just as he had taken his time dismembering and persecuting those creatures smaller than him, the demon larvae were in no hurry lazily chewing at their screaming host with their tiny razored mandibles until there was nothing left of him save a sack of toughened skin. However, Grandfather Nurgle, in his benevolence, wished not to kill Bloab, but to put him to new use. With the energies of Nurgle sustaining him, Bloab survived this ordeal, even with his insides hollowed out like a drained gourd. One by one, 
The fat pupae that wriggled inside of him matured and split. New demon flies hatched one after the other to crawl out of Bloeb's mouth and buzz in his wake. Their affection for their host, like that of grateful children, was unseen anywhere in Nurgle's garden. Since that grotesque experience, Bloeb Ratspawn has found himself high in the favor of Nurgle, for the Lord of Decay is a forgiving of his worshippers, as an indulgent father is of his errant sons. When Bloeb became enraged, the courtiers of his flesh ripple and pulse, spells of rot and dismemberment spilling from his lips as the demon flies hiss praises to Nurgle around him. Bloeb was even allowed to walk the paths of his master's garden, escorted through its treacherous reaches by a humanoid figure that coalesced from a very small swarm that makes his flesh sack its home. There he stood upon the threshold of Nurgle's great rotting manse, marveling at its entropic glory. He did not have the courage to disturb his master's studies at the cauldron, though, when Bloeb made his presence, he found that a pair of bells from the wind speaker that had clanged softly on Nurgle's veranda now hung from his traveling scythe. They still hang there now, their dolorous toll harming the concentration of enemy mages and helping Bloeb to focus his own. Bloeb has truly repented of his former sins, taking great pains to overcome sterility wherever he finds it. So tirelessly has Bloeb been in his propagation of his master's diseases that after introducing the contagion known as the Black Blossoms to the tribes across the mortal realms, he awoke one morning to find a giant pox maggoth looming over him. The long-limbed creature had sought him out, not with the intent to maul and destroy, but to befriend. Once Bloeb had recovered from his shock, his demon flies gently swarmed around him and lifted him atop its mighty shoulders. Bloeb's joy was magnified threefold when a warband of vengeful youths sought him out. His pox maggoth heaved great sloshing balls of acid bile into their ranks as his demon fly swarms fell upon them in a frenzy of tiny mantibles. His pets attacked with such fury that they laid the tribesmen low before Bloeb had muttered a single incantation. Since that day Bloeb has been known in the north as a lord of demon flies, a title that he delights in. Not content to rest on his laurels, Bloeb Rotspawn has traveled south with the intention of bringing the joys of the plague to the civilized realms. Now it is his maggoth, Bile Spurter, that dismembers his victims and his demon flies that ensures he has space enough to work. In recent months his swarm has thinned in number, its eldest members buzzing out in lengthy migrations to seek out new champions for Nurgle. Rumor has it that those touched by the Lord of the Demon Flies swarm are destined for great things, though there are just as many reports of their painful bites bearing deadly infections as there are rumors of the seeds of greatness. This has been a tale of Bload Rotspawn, Chaos Sorcerer of Nurgle. The young warrior known as Morbidex Fireborn had a troubled birth, heaved from his mother's womb even as his parents' village was being burned down around their ears. Badly disfigured by the flames, Morbidex's fearsome appearance impressed all who saw it. Yet it was his skill at arms that saw him rise to chieftain of his tribe, for Morbidex was a merciless fighter with a will to win and a will of iron. Morbidex had been brought up as a devout worshipper of the Dark Gods, and he had listened to all of his shamans. During their nightly tutelage, he learned that the great god Zeech was associated with the flames of change. The young chieftain grew to believe that it was the great architect that had scarred him as a baby, and vowed to take his revenge. His shamans were horrified at the very idea, but Fireborn instead had other ideas. He made preparations for a great voyage and set out deep within the realms of chaos. 
he was in search of an aid from Zeech's greatest rival, Grandfather Nurgle. Further and further he went, Morbidex climbing through snowdrifts and hauling himself up mountains in a ceaseless pilgrimage. The landscape around him became stranger, and further and further he went. The chieftain noticed the changing landscape all around him. Caves became glistening mouths. Cliff faces folded in on themselves over and over again. Skies screamed and withered trees clutched at Morbidex as he battled past them. Yet not for one moment did he entertain the idea or the notion of retreat. In the end, the Garden of Nurgle came to Morbidex. The etheric winds were blowing strong that year, and the realm of chaos spilled out into reality consuming the lands in a tide of unreality. Unholy vegetation spread rapidly across the glacier and ice flow alike. Fungi sprouted and spores choked the air until the world became ever more similar to the functed paradise of the Lord of Decay. Morbidex was climbing the sheer side of the peaks with only a pair of sharp axes when this wave of strangeness washed over him as he hung precariously from the mountainside, an avalanche descended upon him, not of snow and not of ice, but of giggling, excited little nurglings. The nurglings' avalanche took Morbidex with it and all the way to the bottom of the mountain, each of the portly little demons squealing in delight around the chieftain as they tumbled into the mortal realm below. The chieftain cried out too, but not in joy, for he feared he was being carried to his death. Buried alive by countless tones of sporadic, farting demon flesh, Morbidex lost consciousness. When he recovered, he was swimming in a pitch-dark morass of diseased liquids and squishy, bloated bodies. He did not know which way was up and which way was down, and his breath came in ragged gasps, each foul mouthful carrying a throat-searing stink he tried to dig his way through the mass, flailing and trashing and flailing as the nurglings around him tittered and wriggled, occasionally tickling him or poking tiny holes in his flesh. The boldest of the nurglings introduced himself as little Bubo. He slipped and squirted his way through the living quagmire to Morbidex's side. He asked the chieftain a child's riddle, and though fireborn, suddenly ignored it all at first. Eventually, he gave the answer. It was a riddle he himself had told as a child. Little Bubo burrowed down and yanked hard at Morbidex's belt. But he was a little stronger than an infant and achieved nothing. Next to speak was Bullboil, a comparatively brawny nurgling with a steer of horns. He asked the trapped chieftain a riddle of his own, and after a long thought, Morbidex gave the correct answer to this conundrum. Bullboil shoulders his way to Morbidex's feet and pushed upwards, with all his incontrollable might. Over and over again, this strange test and undertaking, each of the bravest nurglings asking his own type of riddle. Those to whom Morbidex gave the right answer would aid him, pushing him and pulling him as the chieftain struggled to get free. Though they were individually weak, when a dozen or more nurglings strove to help, their aid finally did pay off. Slowly, inch by painstaking inch, Fireborn managed to climb through the morass. There was a price to be paid, you see. Of course there would be, as there was always when dealing with demons. Those nurglings to whom Morbidex gave the wrong answer would laugh evilly and touch a part of his anatomy with their spindly fingers. Mere moments later, that part of Morbidex would change to echo the form of the demon might that had touched it. When the chieftain failed to answer another riddle, he felt his belly distended to become a pallid boulder of serpenting fat. When the next question went unanswered, Morbidex found a tentacle sprouting painfully from his left elbow. Last of all was a question posed by a nurgling named Grinling. A Nurgling, who had suckled at Nurgle's own blistered teat. 
The riddle was simple in nature. What were a man's desires next to those of a god? By this point, Morbidex was at his wit's end. His head was swimming. He roared in frustration and caught the nurgling in his hands, squishing it until it popped like an overripe pimple. He found his maddened shout changed to a contrato yelp, then to a high-pitched giggle as his face changed to that of the nurgling he had just destroyed. Morbidex fought through the pain of his transformation, bursting up from the nurgling tide like a zombie clawing out of the grave. The demon mites, impressed by the tenacity of the champion in their midst, cheered in unison as Morbidex threw back his newly horned head and laughed maniacally at the shimmering skies. Morbidex had been followed by hundreds of jubilant nurglings ever since. He was born on the squelching, farting pile of creatures to the caves beneath the peaks, where he introduced himself as Morbidex Twiceborn, recognizing a kind of spirit. Orgrot's demon spew offered Morbidex the position of Jarl in his tribe, provided, of course, that he could conquer a beast of greater size than a mere nurgling. Incensed, Morbidex set off for the Eternal Lagoon in search of a pox magath, much like the one that Orgots himself rode. He found one soon enough, a giant drooling fiend with a triple tongue protruding from its mouth. The chieftain ducked and rolled out of the Magoth's powerful swings, and though his nurgling distracted and confused the beast, whenever Morbidex's scythe lopped off a limb or a tongue, it would simply and swiftly grow right back. The rampaging Magoth swallowed dozens of Morbidex's demon mites whole, and, for a while, the chieftain feared for his own life. However, the pox Magoth's unholy appetite proved to be its downfall. The nurglings inside the Magoth frolicked into its stomach, covered in all of its acids, giggling and splashing even as they dissolved. Blending their essence with the beast, they mingled their minds with that of the devourer, until it too became a devoted follower of Twiceborn. Morbidex rode the beast back to Orgots, taking his place at Demon Spew's right hand. This has been the tale of Morbidex Twiceborn, champion of Nurgle. My friends, I hope you have enjoyed this segment of the Magoth Lords. I hope you will remember the tales of Orgoth's Demon Spew, the Chaos Lord of Nurgle. Bloab Rotspawned, Chaos Sorcerer of Nurgle, and of course, Morbidex Twiceborn, Champion of Nurgle, all Magoth Lords. Hello, and thank you for listening to this installment of Nurgle November. I hope you enjoyed this bit of fun as we head towards the new release for Nurgle uh, for Age of Sigmar 3.0. So be on the lookout for more Nurgle Novembers to come very, very soon. But until then, stay gross, you gamer goons. See you next time. Bye. Remember this, my little pimples. The grandfather loves you. Let me blow you a kiss. (laughs) 